All right, let's resume our discussion of the meaning of the activity coefficient. What is it? What does it mean? What is it all about? Okay, so it turns out that there is a concentration dependence of our activity coefficient. Uh, and this table, table 5.2 from the book, is comparing the activity coefficients uh, and corresponding excess free energies of a bunch of different organic compounds here in both dilute and in saturated systems. So the little infinity symbol here means that we're at infinite dilution, and the sat here, of course, means we're at saturation. So the activity coefficient does change slightly depending on whether you're at saturation or you're at infinite dilution. So here's your activity coefficient at infinite dilution. Uh, so we're starting here at the top of the the table with things that are pretty polar and very small. So methanol is a very small molecule. It's an alcohol, so it's polar and it can hydrogen bond. It can both accept and donate hydrogen bonds. And you notice that its saturation solubility is, is infinite. It's infinitely miscible with water. But in dilute, uh, if you have dilute concentrations of methanol, just a small amount of methanol in water, the activity coefficient is a little bit greater than one. Remember, we said that the activity coefficient is a measure of the non-ideal behavior. An activity coefficient of one implies perfectly ideal behavior. Here, we're just a little bit above one, so just a little bit outside of the range of ideal behavior. Ethanol, slightly bigger. Now, the activity coefficient is a little bit more than doubled to 3.7. And then as we go down the chart here, we get to larger and larger and more hydrophobic chemicals until we get down here to benzoapyrene, which is a really big molecule and pretty much totally nonpolar. And so first of all, you notice that the activity coefficients are now 10 to the eighth. So these are really huge activity coefficients. And remember that the solubility is proportional to one over the activity coefficient, right? So if the activity coefficient is 10 to the eighth, that means the solubility is down somewhere around 10 to the minus eighth. So these are very insoluble compounds. Uh, and the other thing you notice is that there is a slight difference between the activity coefficient at saturation and the activity coefficient at infinite dilution, okay? Sometimes it's not huge. This is only a difference of 0.5, which is, you know, 10, 15 percent. Uh, but there are some scenarios where the difference is bigger. Um, so here for 2255 tetrachlorobiphenyl, the activity coefficients differ by about an order of magnitude, depending on whether you're at saturated or dilute solution. Now, the one thing you have to say about this table, though, is that this is really tough to measure. How do you measure the solubility and therefore the activity coefficient of a tetrachloro PCB? It turns out it's not easy because the solubility is so low, right? The solubility is tiny. Uh, so I'm a little bit skeptical of these numbers that you can accurately measure the activity coefficients, both under saturated and dilute uh, solution conditions. So take these with a grain of salt. But the point is that there are slight differences between the activity coefficient of the compound when it's in saturation and its activity coefficient in infinite dilution. In the real world, we hope that most of our chemicals are pretty close to infinite dilution, right? We hope that the concentrations of nasty chemicals like these are not approaching saturation, but they might be. Okay, so let's talk about the dissolution process. How does this work? What does it do? Uh, the two most important driving forces in determining the extent of dissolution of the substance in any liquid solvent, although we're mostly talking about water here, are the entropy, obviously, and the enthalpy, like every other process. And the entropy of the system has to do with just the random mixing of two different things, water and your chemical, right? So, for example, if I have a beaker full of blue marbles and a beaker full of red marbles, in that state, they have a relatively low entropy, low randomness. But if I take them and I mix them together and I now have a big pile of red and blue marbles, that, that system has a much higher entropy. It's just more random. And so just the fact of mixing two different things together is going to introduce a certain amount of disorder or entropy into the system. But the other thing that's of course important, of course, is the intermolecular forces, which has to do with the enthalpy term. How much energy or enthalpy is required to form or destroy the intermolecular bonds so you can rearrange them and, and dissolve the compound in water. In an ideal liquid, the solubility of the ideal liquid is determined by the energy lowering from mixing the two substances, right? So for ideal liquids in dilute solution in water, the intermolecular attractive forces would be identical. Again, ideal, we're talking about ideal liquids here. So for ideal liquids in dilute solution, the intermolecular attractive forces are identical and the delta H is gonna be zero, 
So then the, the free energy change when you dissolve the compound, since delta H is zero, the only thing that's left is your entropy. And we're going to call this entropy delta S mix. And again, that's the entropy that you get just by the fact that you're mixing red and blue marbles. <clears throat> and of course, it's related to the change in the mole fraction concentrations because that's what you're mixing. You know, that's, that's the change in concentration of the red marbles in the blue marbles, which are, you could think of the blue marbles as water. Okay, uh, so the mole fraction of the solvent is pretty, going to be pretty close to one if you're in dilute solution. So we don't have to worry about its mole fraction concentration changing. So it's really just the mole fraction change in concentration for the chemical of interest, which we've th throughout this have called chemical I, right? So the greater the dissolution, the smaller and more negative the value of delta GS will be, and the more spontaneous the dissolution process. We already know that uh, because the smaller delta G is, the less energy is required, and so it's more spontaneous. The, the reaction is easier to move forward. Okay, so that was for ideal liquids. For non-ideal li er, liquids, the intermolecular, attra intermolecular attractive forces are now not equal in magnitude, magnitude between the pure organic compound and the organic compound once it's dissolved in water. Okay, so you have an overall delta G of dissolving this compound in the solution, and it's going to be equal to that delta G of mixing that we just talked about, where the only thing that mattered there was delta S, because delta H was assumed to be zero. And then this thing, which we're going to call the excess Gibbs free energy, the extra Gibbs free energy that's not involved with just mixing the red and the blue marbles. So the delta G of solution overall, we have uh, delta H and T delta S, like we always do. And then <clears throat> we have the excess enthalpy of mixing, and we have T temperature times delta S. So we have the delta X of mixing here, and then the delta S E, which is the excess uh, delta S. So this is a confusing and scatterbrained way of saying something relatively simple, which is that what we care about here is the delta H E, the intermolecular attractive forces. Uh, that is, has to do, again, with our three types of intermolecular forces. We've got hydrogen bonding, we have polarity, and we have van der Waals forces. And then we have delta S, which is the, the energy required, the entropy change in creating a big cavity in the middle of the water that will house the chemical. And the bigger that cavity, the bigger the size of the molecule, the more entropy is lost. Right, because by, by creating a hole, by making a hole in the water, you're losing entropy. No longer are water molecules floating freely wherever they want to go. Now they've been cordoned off and restricted from a certain zone where the chemical is going to be dissolved. So this gives you an idea of some of the different entropy and enthalpy terms we might be talking about. And again, there's a whole bunch of different compounds from low molecular weight nonpolar high molecular weight nonpolar, and a few sort of medium molecular weight polar things here in the middle. And notice that they're increasing in molar volume. So this is the smallest and this is the largest in terms of molar volume. So the delta G's bounce around here, you know, around anywhere from maybe eight up to about 20 or so uh, kilojoules per mole delta G. And then when we get to the really big molecules, then they really start to go north and you can end up with almost 50 kilojoules per mole down here for delta G. Uh, and so that's a function, of course, again, of the delta H and the delta S. Okay, so this, notice, I don't know why in the textbooks, but somehow we've lost the delta here. <laughs> the delta went away. Never been able to figure out exactly where it went. But in your textbook, Whenever they're talking about the, the delta H term, the enthalpy required to dissolve the compound in water, it's just called HEW, excess enthalpy of dissolution. And it has to do with that whole conversation we just had about how there's a, there's a delta H of mixing, but that delta H of mixing is assumed to be zero. Anyway, for some reason we lost the delta there. But notice that this excess enthalpy of dissolution is small, and it's going to be slightly different between saturated and dilute solutions, because as we saw, the activity coefficient was different between saturated and dilute solutions. But it's pretty small, and it bounces around zero for small molecules, okay? And it's occasionally even quite negative for something like diethyl ether, which is diethyl ether can't hydrogen bond with itself because it can't donate. It can only accept hydrogen bonds. 
So when you dissolve diethyl ether in water, it is for the first time creating a bunch of new hydrogen bonds, and that's a very favorable process. So you get a big negative number there. Uh, but for the most part, this excess enthalpy of dissolution is small, bounces around zero, and then it's not until you get to these really large hydrophobic chemicals that suddenly this excess enthalpy of dissolution starts to be really meaningful. 10, 20, 40, 60 kilojoules per mole. Uh, so it's only when you get to the really big molecules that HEW is going to be significant and large. So estimating the, the value of HEW is something we have to occasionally do in order to predict how solubility is going to change with temperature. And unlike delta H of vaporization, which was easy to predict, this HEW is much tougher. So usually what I do is I go to this table and I say, okay, the compound that I'm talking about is an aldehyde. So maybe it's sort of similar to benzaldehyde. And so I'm going to say maybe it's around five kilojoules per mole. Or I'm talking about a giant PCB molecule, maybe similar to hexachlorobenzene. So I'm going to guess maybe the, the HEW is around 20 kilojoules per mole. But that's the best that I can do. I don't have a good equation to give you to explain how to estimate HEW. All you can do is look at this table and kind of guesstimate. Okay, and then in the final column we have, they've, they've multiplied uh, the, the, the entropy change by temperature so that we can put it in the same units, kilojoules per mole. And again, saturated versus dilute solution. But notice that for small molecules, the entropy change is small, okay, and it's negative which is saying that it's favorable. You know, you're, you're mixing red and blue marbles, you're scrambling the eggs, it's, you know, all things, all kinds of crazy things are happening, and that is an increase in entropy, so that gives you a, a favorable entropy term. But then when you get down to these giant molecules, frequently these entropy terms start to get reasonably large and positive. And that is because to, in order to create a hole big enough to hold on to these chemicals, you have to you know, push the water molecules aside. And then around those uh, empty cavities, the water starts to form what's called a flickering crystal, which is where the water molecules line up and hold hands, meaning that they hydrogen bond to each other. Uh, and, they, and they put together this flickering crystal that exists around the cavity that's been created to house this giant molecule. And that fixes both the orientation of the water and of the organic molecule, and that decreases the entropy. So for these very large molecules, the entropy term can be reasonably large and positive. Uh, and so that's just a, a, another expression of the fact that giant molecules are really difficult to dissolve because they take a giant cavity. And creating that cavity means pushing aside all the existing hydrogen bonds. And that takes energy, and it also has an effect on enthalpy. So let's conceptually think about how this solubility process works. So we start out with our organic compound, and it's drawn here as these, these big L-shaped things because we're implying that it's a big thing. You know, it's, it has some size to it. And then the water molecules are drawn as these little tiny L-shaped things because we're implying that they're small, right? So we start out with our pure organic liquid in our pure water. And the first thing you got to do is take one of these uh, molecules of organic liquid and isolate it from all of its brothers. You know, make, so to do that, you have to break the attraction between the organic chemical and other organic chemicals. That takes energy. Now, if this compound is not polar at all and can't hydrogen bond, it doesn't take a whole lot of energy. But if the compound can hydrogen bond or is very polar, it does take a lot of energy to pull it away from its brethren. So this, this term can be large uh, for polar compounds and hydrogen bonding compounds, or it can be pretty small for things that are totally nonpolar. At the same time you're doing this, you gotta make a cavity within the water, and to do that, you have to break the bonds between the water and the other water molecules. Those hydrogen bonds are reasonably powerful. So this is a relatively large term. This takes a fair amount of energy to do this. Now you're gonna take your isolated organic molecule and put it in the cavity. Okay, so here it is now in its little cavity. It's happy, right? Oops, there we go. Um, and when you do that, you're creating or intermolecular bonds or forces between the organic molecule and the water molecules. So the question is, is the energy you get back here big enough to overcome the energy you spent up here? And usually the answer is no, okay? So you get a little bit of energy back, but not a whole lot. 
And then the last thing that happens is that the water molecules now reorient themselves around the organic compound. And so you notice the way that this is drawn, these water molecules are now a little bit closer to each other, a little bit more compact, whereas up here they're a little bit more spread out. So that's why they're trying to show in their cartoon form that water is forming that flickering crystal around the organic molecule. And when you do that, you're losing entropy. You might be increasing some enthalpy, you might be getting some energy back because you're strengthening those, those water to water hydrogen bonds, uh, but you're definitely losing entropy when you do it. So you get all these different entropy and enthalpy interactions going on. Um, and they can be, you know, a very, the enthalpy and entropy terms can be of varying sizes. And the question is, what is sort of the balance of all of those?